Well, I'm back home in Tampa, and it's time now to sort of, I thought what I do, it's 72 hours before the election, is catch up, provide an update. Have I changed my mind about the general outcome of the election? I've been arguing since August 2019 that, I got this when I posted my first video saying that Trump would be reelected. Have I changed my mind about the states that I talked about two weeks ago, the swing states, Florida, Pennsylvania, North Carolina, Arizona? No. Nothing's changed. As a matter of fact, I'm even more convinced that all my calls are right. But we'll see in 72 hours. The first thing I was eager to do when I got home was to check out what had happened at the dueling rallies on Thursday in Tampa. Joe Biden was here. Donald Trump was here. What had happened? And it was very interesting reading the local paper, the Tampa Bay Times, which I gave up on over two years ago and canceled. Uh, it's a, a, a poorly managed, totally biased paper, which I can live without. Uh, but I went online and even though I canceled them two years ago, I can still get in online and they haven't figured out that I'm not a subscriber anymore. So I can get in and read around if I want. And, and the stories were really interesting. For example, Trump was at Raymond James Stadium, which is where the Tampa Bay Buccaneers play. Now, the crowd wasn't up in the stands. The crowd was on the field itself and the surrounding grounds, which is a pretty big area. How many people were there? They don't say. According to uh, the Trump campaign, uh, there were requests for 15,000 tickets. Were there 15,000 people there? I have no idea. Nobody seems to have offered a number in any of the reports that I saw, other than to say there were thousands, which there clearly were. Were there 15,000? Looking at the photos, I don't know. I'm not like a crowd expert or something, but there were certainly thousands there, probably more than 10,000 people there. But the most interesting in the story was they didn't talk about, you know, Trump or what he was saying so much or the enthusiasm of the people. They talked about what he put them through. It was, it was just under 90 degrees when he was speaking. It was like uh, early afternoon on Thursday. And the people were hot. Several dropped from heat stroke. People were fanning themselves, you know, you know, fl fl fluffing their clothes up, trying to get some air underneath because they were sweating to death. Now, I've been in uh, Raymond James for a football game in September, early September. It's, it's, it's brutal in there. That's why the place we really need a dome stadium here, but we're not going to get it because... Uh, you know, people don't come to the game. Of course, people don't come to the game because we don't have a dome stadium. So it's sort of like a catch-22. I don't know how they're going to figure that out, but that's that's beyond this video. But they, you know, it was all about, oh, you know, like Trump was doing this to these poor people. Like he made them come. He made them suffer through this heat to listen to him. I mean, they were there of their own volition. You know, they were there because they were excited. They had waited in line to get in. They had, they had applied to get tickets. But that that was the portrayal. So then early evening, I think it was around 6.30, Joe Biden had his uh, uh, event. They don't call it a rally or a drive-in rally because of COVID restrictions, you know, yada, 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 all that bull crap. And he was out at the fairgrounds. And I know where the fairgrounds are. I've been there several times. So I think the last time I was there, I saw Doobie Brothers at the fairgrounds. And it was in the parking lot. The parking lot there is huge. Uh, Trump appeared there earlier this year, not in the parking lot actually in the facility itself. And there were 10,000 people there to see Donald Trump. I think that was back in the summer too. And that place is all exposed and hot and, and you bake. But he got 10,000 people there earlier. How many did Joe Biden have? Couldn't tell. No overhead shots, no drone shots, no helicopter, news helicopter shots. Fly over. It's, it's a huge parking lot. It's, it covers, it's, it's big. They, you could get, I mean, obviously if you can get 10,000 people or more in that place, you have to be able to get, you know, I don't know, what, 7,000 cars, 6,000 cars at least. There weren't anywhere near that number there. According to some accounts, I saw 300 cars. Some people said 400 cars. So let's go with 350 cars. And let's assume at least two people on average come in a car, maybe two and a half. So if you had 350 people times two, that would be around 700. So maybe there were I would say it's probably safe to say there were under a thousand people there. Now remember, Trump's got somewhere between ten and fifteen thousand at his rally. Joe Biden has under a thousand. A couple of weeks ago, I think it was in Sanford, Florida, near Orlando, Mike Pence spoke to a crowd of four thousand. So basically, Mike Pence had at least 
four times the number of people at his rally as Joe Biden did at his in Tampa, which is, is a much bigger metropolis compared to uh, Sanford, although it's still near Orlando. But this is like right in Tampa itself. So that certainly doesn't look good for Biden. And, you know, poor Joe. Uh, about halfway through, there was a downpour and it's all outdoors and he was outdoors. I mean, it was and when it when it pours here, it pours. Uh, you know, the, the hockey team is named the Hurricanes. I'm, I'm not that's a shoot, North Carolina. That's I'm back in Greenville. Uh, the hockey team here is the Lightning, which and they just won the Sandy Cup. But, you know, Tampa, Florida is the lightning capital of the United States, if not the world. I mean, it's a lot of lightning here and a lot of storms. So when you get a torrential, you know, uh, uh, sort of tr tropical storm at night, it really rains. And there are all kinds of other problems which you can get lightning strikes. So they had to cancel about half to two thirds of the way through. They had to cut the thing short and tell everybody to go home. And they had to get, you know, Biden off the stage and undercover. Because uh, when it comes down here, it comes down. And if you're outside, you, you're going to get soaked quick. So... That didn't go that well. So th those are, are the two, two dueling uh, events on Thursday. And if anything, it would show, it seemed to show that there's more uh, enthusiasm for Donald Trump. What about enthusiasm? What about these rallies and, and drive-ins? What do they mean? Now, I know, and we're told all the time, that you can't judge uh, political things by rallies, by how many people show up. And, you know, basically, I would have agreed to that, with that, at least until 2016, because we were told the same thing in 2016. Rallies are anecdotal. You need to go with the polls. Well, what was more indicative of what was happening in 2016? The rallies we saw between Clinton and Trump, or the polls between Clinton and Trump? You know, the polls weren't right. The rallies were actually a better indication of what was really happening on the ground. And I think that that's true today. At least that's a truth I accept. I'm sure the pollsters don't believe that for a second. But we'll know in well, more than 72 hours, we'll find out uh, four days, five days, what the hell's going on in this country. Because of some really strange things. I mean, I saw last night in the news that Trump was in Butler, Pennsylvania, and there were 35,000 people there. I don't even know where, but I lived in Pennsylvania. I grew up there. I'm not even sure I know where Butler is. But 35,000 people in Butler, Pennsylvania. I mean, you look at the crowds. I think Biden had one decent crowd the other day. Well, I think it was with Obama. And were they there to see Joe or were they there to see Barack? I mean, who can tell? But things, you know, I don't think things are going very well, especially in Pennsylvania. I mean, the riots in Philadelphia, they're fairly localized to, uh, you know, parts of West Philadelphia, although they've spread a little bit into the Northeast and over into Port Richmond. But that's, that's bad news for the Democrats. Uh, it's not that because of the riots, you know, Republicans are going to win in Philadelphia. They're never going to win in Philadelphia. I mean, the Democrats have an overwhelming advantage. But the way Pennsylvania works for, for state races and for the presidential race with the Electoral College is, you know, you got to carry the state. And the way the Democrats carry the state is by winning with overwhelming majorities in Philadelphia. In 2016, if you compare 2016 to 2012 in Philadelphia, I think Hillary lost Hillary lost about 75,000 voters who had voted in a previous election for Barack Obama. They still easily carried the city, which is contiguous with the county, county of Philadelphia, city of Philadelphia, the same exact boundaries. But she lost the state by, I think it was 72, 73,000 votes. The loss of Democratic support in Philadelphia for Hillary compared to Barack Obama cost them Pennsylvania. So, so it's important that they do better this time in Philadelphia. And whether or not they're going to be able to do that with riots going on, and they're still going on, you know, is, is that likely to make people vote for Biden? Or are you going to see more people voting for Trump because there's lawlessness in the city? I mean, you, you can ask that question, answer that question yourself. I think it's more likely that it will prompt some people to vote for Trump rather than prompt some undecided people to vote for Biden. But maybe that's, you know, it's just my opinion and, and maybe I'm just dead wrong. But I think that's bad timing for the Democrats in Philadelphia 
which means it's bad timing for them in Pennsylvania. And when you got things like fracking and all the other stuff going on with Joe and, you know, Biden, Biden came out and said, you know, show me the video. And that's what Trump's doing at the rallies is showing people the video in Pennsylvania of Joe Biden and Kamala Harris saying that they're going to, you know, bring fracking to an end and move away from fossil fuels and not to mention coal mines. So all this, I think, is really going to secure Pennsylvania for Biden. I don't I don't I just don't. I mean, secure Pennsylvania for uh, Donald Trump. I don't think Biden has a chance. But, you know, again, what do I know? Nate Silver, you know, they're going to take Pennsylvania. Most of the other pollsters think they're going to take Pennsylvania. I just don't see it. So a new poll today had uh, Trump up in Arizona, which I had uh, made a video about Arizona. So that doesn't surprise me at all. And it's it's pretty much the, the way it seems to be uh, going in the country. You know, you look at the enthusiasm for Trump. You look at the lack of enthusiasm for Biden and Harris. And then you look at the gaps. I mean, the other day, you've seen the video, you know, Barack Obama introduces Joe Biden and Joe Biden's like off to the right somewhere and he's just wandering around and, and Barack's saying, Joe, come on up here, Joe, or whatever, you know, and, and like Biden can't hear and, and Biden doesn't understand what's going on. And all this stuff going on with uh, with Hunter and uh, Bobolinsky and all this stuff. I mean, I, I know it's being not it's not being covered by the media, but that doesn't mean people aren't figuring it out. People aren't seeing what's going on, and you know, it looks it just looks so suspicious when they won't even cover the story, and everybody's just you know throttling the story. I mean, they they have let the New York Post back up on Twitter. But if you go to the New York Post page, and it, it, it just shows you how not only are they censoring people, but they're not even very bright about it. For example, New York Post had a story on their Twitter feed related to, you know, the Bobolinsky thing. And I could retweet it. But if I went to the New York Post webpage and tried to post it over on Twitter, I was blocked. So there's still in a sense, blocking anything coming in from the outside that has the New York Post URL in the address. But if if the post puts the story up on Twitter itself, then you can retweet it. The same story. And it, it makes no sense. I picked another story. It was about a, uh, uh, I forget what it was. It was something totally innocuous. It had something to do with uh, a celebrity thing. It was totally apolitical. I couldn't get that up on Twitter. That got blocked. So it's clearly it's been anything with the New York Post URL and it coming from the New York Post website is still being blocked, no matter what they're saying. What well, New York Post is saying that they're not blocked anymore, but they are. And I, I you know, I, I let them know about this, that you can't you can't really post from a paper on. You can post within Twitter. So this doesn't make sense. I mean, why allow New York Post to put up the story, but not allow me to repost a story from New York Post website? You know, how, how is that? makes sense. It doesn't make any sense. So these people aren't even, I mean, it's, it's, I know it's all mechanized and it's all done with logarithms. You don't have people consciously doing these things, but somebody's consciously setting up the logarithms to work this way. And it's just stupid. They're just, you know, they're just pissing people off and it, it's not doing them any good. So we still have the same crap going on as, as we head into the election. And it's, it's getting so obvious. I mean, unless you got your head stuck up, you know, Joe Biden or Kamala Harris's uh, butt. I mean, you can see what's happening. And it, it's it's really a shame and it's scary. And it's one of the many things that's starting to scare me about this election. Maybe I'll talk about some of those in, in other videos. Because I'm really getting concerned. Not because I think Joe Biden's going to win. I don't think he is. It's what I'm beginning to get very concerned about is what happens when he loses. You know, how are they going to react? I know they got slaughtered in 1972. The Democrats sat back, reassessed their position, and moved more toward the center. In 1976, running Jimmy Carter, who was seen as a sort of a centrist technocrat. I think they're too far gone this time to do that. And, uh, you know, as I keep saying over and over again, progressives love to double down. And I think that's what they're going to do. They're going to lose and they're just going to do the same things they've been doing for the last three and a half years. If they hold on to the House, there'll be more investigations. They'll bury the things that they want buried. And they'll, be, they'll unloose, unloose their gangs 
in the streets. In some ways, they've already done that. And you may have seen some of the videos, undercover videos that, that people got hold of, of people planning unrest and actually what they're calling a coup in Washington, D.C. in the days after the election. I mean, this stuff is all floating around out there. And it, it's, it's really worrisome. You remember, this is just these are my political videos on my, you know, election 2020 playlist. If you go to my coming civil war playlist, you'll see all the other videos about, you know, I'm arguing that we're moving more deeply into a full scale civil war. And, and, and that's what's really beginning to scare me, given what I'm seeing. I mean, the media, the pollsters, all these people are so far in, so committed, so willing to just cast journalism aside that I don't see how they can survive without just going all the way. I mean, they're, they're, it's like you know, you're playing uh, poker, uh, Texas Hold'em, you know, and eventually you, you find yourself in positions where, you know, I might as well just go all in and hope for the best. And I think maybe the Democrats are at that point, the progressive left, the elites in this country are at that point that they might as well go all in. And that's how the last civil war got started. The South decided to go all in. You know, they, they lost an election. Abraham Lincoln was elected in 1860. They had lost the Senate. They had lost the House. Lincoln won the Electoral College. He only had 40% of the vote. 60% of the people voted for the three Democrats who were running against Lincoln. Basically, the Democrats got 60% of the vote. Lincoln got 40%, but he won in the Electoral College. And they had all the leaders of government, and what did the South do? Say, okay, we need to reassess. Maybe we need to rethink the institution of slavery. Maybe we need to rethink our positions on it. No. Fort Sumter. Full-scale civil war. So we'll see what happens uh, after, after the election and after Trump's electoral victory, which I am more convinced today, I feel more secure saying this today, which is November 1st, 2020, than I did when I posted my first video on Trump's re-election prospects back in August 2019. Not August 2020, it was August 2019. You can go back and you can find it in the election 2020 playlist. I feel more confident of what I've been saying today than I did back then. Anyway, what's your take? Uh, let me know in a comment. I'd love to, to hear what you think. And if you can, give this video a thumbs up, subscribe to the channel, That's, that really helps. And uh, share the video with your friends if you can. Hit the notification button so you know when I post new videos. And until the next time, stand tall, stand firm, and keep fighting.